This episode of The Honeydew is brought to you by Ritual and Stitch Fix. More on that later. Let's get into the do. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I am Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. Look, do me a favor. Make sure you are subscribed to the YouTube channel. I love all of you out there watching, commenting. Please subscribe. Also, make sure if you want extra Honeydew and you want to be part of the Patreon community, you can uh, subscribe there as well. If you sign up for a year, you'll save on over a month of free episodes um, it is a wild show. We are hearing some crazy shit from y'all out there. You've not let me down. I told Ash when we started, like, dude, we cast this net out here. I don't know what the fuck we're going to get. We're, we're getting, we're getting some shit. All right. That thing is growing. It's only five bucks a month. Um, so sign up. And if you or someone, you know, has that story that needs to be heard, please submit at honeydewpodcast at gmail.com. All right. Uh, I record here at the Santa Monica Music Center. So if you or anyone you know needs musical lessons, musical instruments, your kids, Santa Monica Music Center is the spot. They've got the online classes now. Go to santamonicamusic.com. Use the code honeydew. They'll waive the registration fee and they'll give you a free lesson when you sign up for a package. All right. Now that that's out of the way. Um, you know what we do over here? We highlight the low lights. These are the stories behind the storytellers. We like to shed a little light on that darkness. And today, it is a pleasure to have this gentleman in here, uh, formerly a Crab Feast guest with a great episode. Please welcome, first time, Josh Robert Thompson. Oh, JRT yeah. JRT in the house. Here I am, Ryan Sickler. <laughs> it's the honeydew. Oh, man. I was hoping you would do all oh, these. Oh, he's coming out of the gate swinging. Yeah, man. It and, is so uh, good to have good you Good to see you. And <laughs> this is a voice. I, I'll be doing voices to deflect my pain. <laughs> Honeydew. Yeah. <laughs> man, you're giving me so many sound drops. Right Honeydew. <laughs> you know what? Josh Robert Thompson, his pain probably isn't even good enough to be on this show. <laughs> Like I, I get worried about like in my career that my work isn't good enough. This is the first time I've ever been really worried that my trauma isn't going to be as good. <laughs> I'm sure you're because I watch some of these episodes. You got some fucked up people that Listen, come on the show. They, Sad, man. no doubt, no doubt. And I, but it's also a perspective thing because you can sometimes I sit here and I think to myself often I'm like, what am I fucking complaining about? Right. You know what I mean? It, right. And then I hear other people and I'm like, this is. This is your fun. This That's is your trauma, right? Yeah. You know? That's what I've been for for a whole week. I've been racking my brain, like no, I gotta you, come up with something good. You're from Cleveland. It, it's off to a great start. <laughs> starts you know right saying? away. It starts right away. Right when you're born in Cleveland. <laughs> That's the trauma. Um, well, before we get into all this, please uh, plug everything and anything you'd like. Well, I don't, if you still do websites, you can go to thejrtshow.com. That's t h e j r t show dot com. Your one-stop shop for Josh Robert Thompson. My mom always gets the site wrong. Is it so JRT.com? No, it's the T H E J R T Show.com. Someone else took JRT Show. Somebody for real did? On purpose. Now it's going for like $2,500. <laughs> so fuck you, whoever you are. JRT.com? No, mom. The JRT Show.com. The JRT Show. You can find all my shit com. there, man. All right. Yeah. Um, you know, if you haven't heard uh, Josh's Crab Feast episode, mm. it's a great fucking episode. There's a hardcore group that listens to the episodes. Yeah. Yours, yours is always picked as a fave. They That's love fun. the characters. Um, you know, you, you were just, I, I mean, you had the DJ. La There's so many oh, of them. Oh, the D Kenny Loggins. Kenny Loggins. K-Log, <laughs> K-L-O-G, all Kenny, all the time. Coming up, we got a continuous four-hour block of Kenny. We call it the Log Jam. Here's a little danger zone to get you home. Here's Kenny. And that's all they play. That's and then it'll be like it'll be like Kenny Loggins. Traffic, all the time. traffic is backed up on the four hundred five. Be careful out there. You might say it's a danger zone. Here's Kenny. Just and no matter what. I'm glad you love that man. That's my favorite. I love it. It's one of those that stands uh, out, man. Yeah, good. they're great. That's great stuff. Uh. Um, and I told Ash. Ash got all excited because I go, you know who Josh is? He's like, it's what you say, but he's younger. And I go. Titty sprinkles. He's like, nah. Aw. Oh, he knew. Yeah, the, everybody knows titty, titty sprinkles. sprinkles. Yeah, everybody knows titty. Well, sprinkles. that was. Uh, I sometimes do the Morgan Freeman voice, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, there he goes. 
And there was a meme going around that said something like, uh, right now when you're reading this picture, you seeing uh, you, you sound like you feel like you sound like Morgan Freeman or something like that. And then it says titty sprinkles at the end. I don't know what they are, but I'm sure they taste good. I'll bet you they taste oh, good. Oh, I know. They sound like heaven. Josh when is going to do this voice to make his pain sound poetic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you say shit like, Josh was born uh, off 117th in Cleveland, Ohio, a rough neighborhood where people would, you know, sick dogs on them just for fun. <laughs> Did that happen? Yeah, like, I remember, I'll never forget. <laughs> the, you, know. you can do the whole episode yeah. of your trauma. It makes it sound so nice. <laughs> Let me ask Josh real quick, yeah, Morgan. Yeah. Did that really happen? That really happened. Let's uh, let's get into your story. Yeah. Please. Cleveland born. Yeah. Cleveland born off uh, 117th and Florian. If anybody wants to go down to that neighborhood and <laughs> go go stop by, visit, say hi to the folks over there. In fact, I was back there a couple years ago, just decided to take a stroll down my old street and I uh, was marveling at all the houses. These houses were built in like 1901. Mm -hmm. Beautiful old houses. We lived up on the top floor, me, my mom, and my stepdad. And then downstairs was the landlord, Mrs. Van Duzer, this little old lady, almost 90 years old. And uh, But I'm in my old neighborhood a couple years ago, walking down the street, and I see my house, and there's a woman taking groceries out of her car, and she sees me kind of looking at the house, and she takes a look at me, gives me a once-over, and says, uh, are you lost? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, well, no, I used to live here, ma'am. My name's Josh Robert Thompson. I come from uh, Los Angeles, the big city. You know, I grew up up there in that house that you live in, you know. But she said the neighborhood was okay. It's okay now. But back when I lived there, this was in the 80s. I got my ass beat, like, on a daily basis. I'll bet. Just, you, you, yeah, you, I'll I mean, bet. In fact, one time in eighth grade, I remember the, this girl shared a locker, or she had a locker next to mine, and unprovoked, unprovoked, she looked at me and said, you know, you just look like the kind of guy that people want to beat up. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, so I don't know. I hate your face. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but <laughs> that's that's my story. All yeah. right. So, are you are you an only child? I am. Okay. And you're you I was a latchkey kid. Do they still use that word anymore? No, but I was too. We yeah. wanted to do a tour a while back called the Latchkey Kids. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean everybody you can't even do that shit now. You fucking have some latchkey kids on the low key that you gotta do it. But they'll they'll but, fucking set you up for that shit. Oh, is that right? You, you can't, can't be sending you can't some do that fifth anymore? grader home by himself. Yeah, go like. home, you'll be fine. By the way, the house was so old I had an actual skeleton key to get in the house. <laughs> That, Are I you serious? God, yeah. Really? An old metal? Have him like... take the bus. So take the rapid transit. It'll be fine. As soon as I see that key, people are like, we don't want any part of that It's house. true, man. I'm going to start letting my daughter have a key like that. You should do it. I mean, it was an actual skeleton key. I think the house was probably haunted. And uh, I got beat up all the time. I went The school I went to, here, here's a clue as to what was going on. The name of my school was Urban Community School. Oh, come on. The UCS? The UCS. <laughs> What was your mask? Just put an F in front of it. <laughs> we do it all the time. Hey, man, welcome to Urban Community School, man. Today's the first day of school. That was one of the students. That was like third grade, you know? <laughs> That's the students. I, my, my, my buddies were uh, Antoine Houston, Froggy, Frog. Arturo, and Richard Stankovic. <laughs> These were my buddies. Was he a German indoor he soccer was a player? Polish, Polish. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of these guys. Like I, you know, I had to either go home by myself because uh, my parents were both working, or I had to go stay at friends' houses. And the neighborhoods that they lived in were like you know rusted out uh, trucks in the front yard, pit bulls. There were a group of kids that were always setting shit on fire in this alleyway. There was never a day that went by that there wasn't something on fire in the alleyway. Kids pissing off the roof. For real? Yeah. It sounds like a fucked up Norman Rockwell <laughs> painting. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I should, Garrison Keillor should be narrating. <laughs> it's a beautiful day in Cleveland, Ohio. Josh Robert Thompson's a young boy. He's 10 years old. And he's about to get his ass beat by Chris Regan. The grandson of the Regan family down the street. But Chris Regan was an affable bully. He gave you a choice. He said things like, I can either punch you in the face or kick you in the stomach. 
That's true. <laughs> what a what a choice. He goes. He goes. Imagine this choice. <laughs> Okay, listen, man. <coughs> oh, God. Yeah, I wish I could say what he really said, but th- there was a word in the 80s that everybody just said, you know, uh, and you're very homophobic, right now. Hom- homophobic mm-hmm. now, but it was a word we all used that was not, you know, but this guy was like, okay, man, you got a choice. And he had a little guy, I swear this is like out of a Christmas story, which by the way is where they shot a lot of a Christmas story. Oh, is that in right? In my part of town. Okay. Like go watch that movie again and you go, that's I just a, watched That's exactly what that neighborhood looked like. Okay. Untouched. His stoolie, his little guy, yeah, see? He like held my arms behind my back to keep me in place. I was a little guy. I was just, you know, I wasn't fighting back. I was not into fighting. A very passive artist kid, drew cartoons and wrote poems. I didn't, you know. Chris Regan says, all right, I'm going to give you a choice. Because I like you. I don't know what, like, I'm, I either punch you in the face or kick you in the stomach. At, Ten-year-old me has to reason. Yeah. These are your choices. And I was like, well, I don't really want my face fucked up. Why don't you go for the stomach? And this guy, with everything he had, kicked me as hard as he could Man, in I the could stomach. I fucking kill you. I thought I was, Houdini died, I, bro. <laughs> So who was the guy died. that used to shoot the cannonballs <laughs> yeah, at? I, I don't know who he was. That was me. I've seen I was video, 10 years yeah. old, that guy. Didn't work out for me. I was like, you know, in a, in a ball on the ground on yeah. the sidewalk, man. But um, that neighborhood was very, very strange. It was a mix. It was a, a lot of black uh, Puerto Rican. And then, you know, for lack of a better word, just trash, just it's a real trashy kind of neighborhood, you know? We were trying to get out of there. And for a while... Before my stepdad came along, okay. Uh, so, all right, let's my, talk about my real that. father left. I never met him, so he was out of the picture. Did he leave before you were actually born, he or left, right after? He you left were born? Uh, right after I was born, I believe. It's so, very, because of you, yeah. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> he said that. In all. fact. The doctor said, this is according to what my my mom told me that the doctor said when I was born. They said that my dad turned to my mom and said, you know, he just looks like the kind of kid that people want to beat up. (laughs) In the face, I want to punch him in the face. Let's give him a choice. Do we punch him in the face or or kick him in the stomach? (laughs) He gave my mom that choice before I was born. Tell you what, honey, I can either punch you in the face or kick you in the stomach. So he was out of the picture, and there was a, a period of time where it was just me and my mom together till I was like five. Okay. I mean, we were poor, poor. We were on welfare, food stamps. This was this was not a – I mean, Urban Community School, by the way, was a great – is a great school now. It was started in the late 60s by a group, group of nuns. So it was all nuns running the school. But they it was for uh, low-income students, you know. Uh, uh, but that school – you know, it was so tough there that every summer you had to take your desk, pick up your desk. It was one of those big metal desks yeah. with, the, with the top on it, and it had the little ledge inside for your pencils, and the girls would fill that with Elmer's glue because it was kind of the shape of a nail, and they would make fake nails out of Elmer's glue. I remember oh, no this. shit. Okay. That's my Garrison Keillor voice again. It was a <laughs> golden summer. The girls would make nails out of Elmer's glue. Just a beautiful day. <laughs> so, dude, we had to take our desks, those heavy ass desks, nine year old kids, and carry them down two flights of steps to the parking lot where we had recess and scrub them clean because kids would, you know, draw on them and graffiti. Yeah. And so we had to you had clean to that, carry shit. that shit. Yeah. Just imagine like a line of little kids. <laughs> Come on, students, chop, chop. You know, Sister Francis Mary. And I mean, they were they were tough. If you got in trouble, you, you know, you get slapped on the wrist with a ruler. This is real Catholic school, you know. But this was the this was the school where um <clears throat> the first day I was so nervous about going to that school and I got beat up so much and I was terrified to go there. I wanted to get out of there. And it was just a nightmare for me to go there. Uh that I was so nervous that one morning i was about to start fifth grade and i told my mom i I don't feel well i got a stomach ache she says well it's just your nerves honey you'll be fine have some pepto-bismol that was the old yeah the old cure so i took pepto-bismol i felt all right she says you know you need to eat you probably need to eat 
not addressing the real issue. Everything is something else. It's probably, you're just nervous you need to eat. So I had um, a strawberry uh, Pop-Tart. Breakfast of champions, right? Yeah, Yeah. nice layer of sugar and cake and sprinkles. There's a theme here. Pepto-Bismol, strawberry Pop-Tart. I wash it down with uh, Nestle's uh, Strawberry Quick, right? All pink. pink. A lot of pink. pink. Yeah, a lot of pink. (laughs) All sloshing around in there. And so, Josh, I can't help it, man. It just makes it sound so beautiful. So Josh got in the car, and his mother drove him to school, as she often did. And that morning, he felt things would be different. Somehow this time, he had it in the bag. He was going to walk in there victorious. He was going to take on the school year. (laughs) He he was going to come out the other end a hero. (laughs) He kissed his mother goodbye and marched proudly into the cafeteria, which was the assembly area for the morning with the entire student body gathered. Everybody that Josh would see for the entire year (laughs) was in one room. And Josh began to feel his stomach gurgle. And he thought, oh, that just must be the Pop-Tart settling a little bit. Maybe the Nestle Quick is saying hello to me. But he didn't pay no mind. And the teachers began to present the daily activities and Josh suddenly got the sweats, and his face turned as white as snow. And he fell to his knees in the middle of everybody in that auditorium, (laughs) wearing his members-only jacket Uh and his E.T. backpack. (laughs) 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 What a kicker. The E.T. backpack boot. (laughs) And And all in full (laughs) display while he's on his knees. (laughs) He set his E.T. backpack next to him gently, (coughs) his Velcro tennis shoes. (laughs) And it's important to note that he had patches on his jeans. (laughs) They didn't have a lot of money back then. And his mother, although a wonderful woman, was not exactly the best seamstress. You see, she put the patches on the outside of the (laughs) jeans and not on the inside. So that's that's the image. Um, the students closest to Josh began to notice that he was on his knees, and so they backed away slowly and formed a large circle around Josh so everybody could watch and wait and see what was going to happen. And then Josh threw up everything that he had that morning, the Pepto-Bismol, the strawberry Pop-Tart, and the strawberry Quick, all laid out in front of him. And I threw up in front of everybody on the first day of fifth grade. And I'll never forget this little black girl who was standing right next to me. She had a lollipop in her mouth and she had those pigtails. Mm-hmm. She had the braids that were the the plastic balls, the hard balls. And she took the lollipop out of her mouth. I'll never forget. And she said, she pointed to me, she gestured to me like you might, like if someone says, hey, where's the gas station? You go, <laughs> hey, it's over there. <laughs> That's how she gestured to a human. She went like this. That boy puked it. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> oh, that boy puked man. it. <laughs> so for about two weeks, I was affectionately known as uh, Puke Boy. Hey, there goes that kid that threw up. <laughs> In front of the whole school. <laughs> I mean, that. I think that is the summation of my entire life, that moment right there. You know, and uh, I went back to that school not long ago. I actually visited it a few years ago. Oh, God damn. And, I, and some lady, and some very nice lady was cleaning up, mopping one of the floors. It was summertime, so there was no school in session. And I said, hi. I just fucking, hi, I used to, I used to go to school here. And she's like, yeah, I, okay. Do you mind if I look around? I guess so. He didn't give a shit. And, and uh, you know, it looks exactly the same. It looks exactly the no same. No improvements. No. And this is the 80s. Yeah. And I don't think it's a school. Actually, they moved Urban Community School uh, to a nice facility. It's actually like a very well-known school now. So it's, they actually realized their dream of what they wanted it to be, which was a nice facility for low-income students. So that's nice to hear. Yeah. But it wasn't that when I went there, you know. And... um 
it was just, it was rough, man. It was rough, rough. And my stepdad was kind of a tough guy too. And he comes in at you said age five, five, five. that. Okay. Yeah. And how? What did he do? How did your mom meet him? Well, I don't know exactly. I I, I think they probably met at a bar. What did your mom do? <clears throat> she's a nurse. A nurse. Okay. She's a saint. So she's out hustling as a single mom. Yeah. Providing you're going to this school, you're getting fucked up. Yeah. And you don't have a male influence in your life. Right. And at five, you get Here comes one. this guy, this beast of a man. With He's a big, big dude. To me, you know, when you're a kid. Yeah, sure, big, sure. big beard. Who is this? And he was all of like 25 or 26. This was a guy that was like busy, hard drinking, you know. He was an alcoholic, you know, flipping cars. He got in real bar fights where like a guy kicked his eye in with a steel-toed boot. I mean, it all sounds fake, but this yeah. is what he, this is how he grew up. Right. And- his so dad, what are you complaining about, right, pussy? Right, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. Like his dad, um, he's passed away a long time ago now, but his dad, you know, my grandfather was uh, a World War II fighter pilot. Like he dropped bombs. Yeah, like when they were men. Dude, he, he has a leather jacket, the, the Fighting Devil Squadron. There's a devil embroidered on the back. My dad has the jacket still, and it's like this. It's got the mustache and the, and the mm-hmm. thing. And then it has embroidered all the bombs he dropped. There's like 20 bombs Holy on there. Holy shit. So like they're little, like the college helmets with right, the Right, right. <laughs> Look what yeah. I did today, honey. <laughs> and here he comes. He's dropped a 13th bomb. Holy shit. So like you're saying, he's a real man. You know, and those guys came back from the war, and they're like, what are you complaining about? I flew a plane. Those old planes. I don't even know how this yeah, guy did it. So, so that was his dad. And so like uh, he was he was tough on me. Uh, because I think he was young and I think the way that he grew up was tough. And so like, for example, the way that I learned to tell time, uh, he sat me down in the kitchen and he said, you're going to sit here until you learn to tell time. And then he took the clock off the wall, took the batteries out of the back of it. And then he would change the hour and minute hand and just go, what time is it? What time is it? (laughs) And I'd be like, oh, no, it's 5.30. Again, what time is it? I don't know. But I learned, you know how long it took me? Three hours and 26 minutes. <laughs> well, put the hands on that. Put the hands on that. Like this. I don't know. <laughs> I learned how to ride a bike. Um, this is bad. And I love him. I do. He's he's the man. He your is. Parent, are they still together? They're not. They're not. Okay, but he's still in your life. <laughs> he's still in my right, life. Good. And uh, he's a cool dude, man. And he taught me how to ride a bike. I didn't know any different. You know, I didn't know this was how things probably shouldn't be done. But every time I fell off the bike, he would do the pick me up by the arm and spank me. Get back on the goddamn bike. I can't, I keep falling. You're going to learn this. And I learned how to ride a fucking bike. You know, now you tell people that story now and they go, oh, Jesus oh Christ. my God, yeah. you, are you okay? Like my mom, every t- my mom can't hear that story because she thinks, honey, do you need help? Do you need, I'm, like, I'm fine. You know, we, we joke about it. He and I joke about it. But I mean, that was the kind of, So how long, know? how old was your mom? He's 25. They're the about same the same age. age. Yeah. So how long are they together? Oh, they were married for 20, oh, wow. 20 okay. some years, 23, 24 So years. all through your school. Yeah, everything. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they got divorced later in my life. You know, I was like 30 or so. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was just, I mean, he was, he was very supportive of my, of my wanting to be an artist. I mean, he's, he was like big, he's big into sports. I mean, I grew up in Cleveland you know, it's either like you're into sports or you're in the military or you you must be something wrong with you. You know, he was out there fixing cars all the time. And, you know, I th- he tried his best and he was definitely proud of me. I mean, I did plays at the Cleveland Playhouse, which at the time was a big, big deal. I was nine years old and I did all these big, oh, wow, big okay. plays there, you know, and I definitely wanted to be an actor. But in that, you know, in Cle- Cleveland has a, uh, <clears throat> Cleveland has an interesting philosophy about these things, it's like uh, like the Late Late Show, which we'll get to. But I did the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson for years, and then the show course, ended. Yeah, and then but people in Cleveland would say, "You know, it's too bad it ended." But I mean, you know, if you do nothing else, at least you did that. Yeah, 
And yeah. can you imagine if I said that to like a factory worker? Like, well, you worked at the factory for 30 years <laughs> yeah, and it's closed yeah. down. And if you never work another job again, I mean, at least you had that one job. I mean, it's what the fuck. Hey, if you, <laughs> if you never eat again, you know, at least you ate that one time. Oh, that one cheese. What are you talking about? <laughs> but that is the ad. That's what I grew up with. Like, don't don't try too hard and like. And don't be proud of your work. And too hey, if much. you get lucky, then consider yourself a winner. Right. Yeah, you've won. But but don't but don't be too loud about it. Keep yeah. it to yourself. Like a Catholic growing up in a Catholic alcoholic family, you keep everything to yourself. Yeah, everything. Don't make a big deal yeah. out of what you do. You know, so even when I moved to LA, my friends were like, All right, that's enough for that. When are you coming back? Enough for La La Land. Yeah. What are you even doing over there? Yeah. That's what people ask me, by the way. My, my fans are the best. I love them. But I mean, they're tacked. Their bedside manner, maybe not the best. If you read some of the comments recently, you'd think that I had died. Like I, I was on the Kelly Clarkson show a couple months ago. I do voiceover stuff for them. I've been working since the Late Late Show went off the air, but not on anything that people know about. Well, Family Guy. Well, that they don't, you know, they don't like people see uh, Kelly Clarkson and they go, I, I heard you on the Kelly <laughs> oh. Clarkson show. <laughs> I'm so glad you're finally doing something. Finally. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Been six years. Finally. Like all my fans are like my mom. <clears throat> it's just a bunch <clears throat> of my moms. Are you okay? Do you need money? Do you oh, need money? honey? <laughs> but that was, um, you know, then we moved. We moved to the suburbs. Um, we got the hell out of that neighborhood. We moved out of there. I mean, probably '86. Okay. When I moved to Parma, the suburbs of Cleveland, much nicer. Nice little house, half an acre of land, you know. All right. Go out there and mow the lawn. It'll take you 10 minutes. Yeah, it's push like a it. full day of work. You know? What um, do you, and if so, what age do you start wanting to know about your biological father? I mean, are you, was your mom up front with you about this from the get-go, or did you present it and then she started talking to you? How yeah, did he that was, go down? Yeah, I did, I did wonder about. Because he was spoken about in hushed tones. It was the thing we don't talk about. You know, yeah, your father. But did you know his parents? No. No relationship? I didn't, I didn't meet any of those None people. None of that side. He okay. was, he was uh, I don't, I still don't fully know the entire story, to be honest with you. And I, all I, what I know is he wasn't able to see me or he wasn't allowed to see me or. Prison? Sounds like yeah, prison. Sounds that's like what prison. a mental what prison. <laughs> yeah, I mean. And I found out, you know, that he uh, had moved to San Francisco, and I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. And he said, "Yeah, he moved to San Francisco." Okay, and uh, I'd always wanted to meet my real father. And as I got older, I started to ask the questions. Probably by the time I was in, you know, early high school, okay, I was like, "Who, who is this guy? Is he still around? Can I meet him?" Well, you know, I don't know if it's a good idea. And my mom would say, I don't think it's a good idea. You know, I don't, I, I don't know if you're ready for that yet. And um, so she, she could locate him if she needed to, or she knew where his whereabouts. Yeah. At least. And I would get these cards occasionally. Okay. From this woman, who said she was my other grandma. Hmm. Birthday cards. Occasionally, I'd get a card, and it would say, "We miss you. We love you." I don't know who these people are, so it was weird to read that. And then it would say, "Give us a call. Here's my phone number." And I was just too afraid to call. I didn't, I, I couldn't really, I didn't understand who this person was. And then uh, this is the hor This is the way I found out that my dad died. He died, okay. 1990, I'm 15 years old. Um, uh, and th this is back when you had to go look through your dad's shit to find porn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he had an amazing... Uh, penthouse magazine collection. But what I was looking for was the penthouse forum, which was the smaller book of just stories, like made up stories, like total bullshit stories. Like yeah. I was working at the gas station and all of a sudden these two bitches came in and next thing I know they're sucking my dick, you know? Five pages of that. That motherfucking S you hit. Right? Is, it's, it's some of my favorite shit, dude. Hey, that man, S. I was walking down the street. I was on yeah. Euclid Avenue. I I was just minding my business, you know? And I so, I know so many people right? from Baltimore that yeah. talk like that. By the I, way. I mean, man. Just as a quick aside, I'm glad you like that because I do that voice out of love. I grew up 
hearing this type of voice. Yeah. It is music to me, dude. It is. Like, when I hear amazing. that, I'm like, oh, I've heard you so many times back home. It's Never true. out here. Never dude, out here. We had a guy that lived next door to me in Cleveland. His name was Rolo. I never heard a brother named Rolo. His his friend would always pull up on a motorcycle, which was always weird because I never saw a brother on a motorcycle. And he'd be like, hey, Rolo. Hey. Hey, yo, Rolo. Hey, Rolo. Hey. Like five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. And then you'd hear, fuck you all, man. Hope you're sleeping, man. Goddamn. But I started hearing this voice, you know, yeah. <laughs> that when it, the one I think I may have told this years ago, but uh, I was in a bus stop uh, when I'd go to I went to Cal, uh, Cleveland State University and I'd take the bus downtown every day to go to school for college. And uh, I was sitting in the bus stop, middle of winter, cold as shit, man. I just want to get on the bus and go home, man. It's a miserable ride back up to uh, Parma. And this 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 black guy comes in with like, you know, jaundiced yellow eyes and he's got like no teeth. And he rests. It's always teeth right. missing. That's the whistles through was, there. Hey, man, what's up, man? <laughs> and it's one of those glass enclosures. How about how you do it <laughs> hey, with man. Teeth. That's the but most impressive. <laughs> you have teeth that you do. I love it. I fucking it goes, love it. It's a glass enclosure, those, those bus stops that are enclosed like that. And he puts one of his feet up against the back of the glass <laughs> and starts banging it as hard as he can. So now the whole thing is shaking. And he looks at me and he goes, how's it feel to be in the last days of living? <laughs> and I, I said, I said, I said, what do you mean? I said, what do you mean? And he says, what you want it to mean? And that's what I was dealing with. That's where that voice comes from. That voice is but fucking. I've never wow. had an issue with that voice when I would do stand up. In fact, I had a lot of black people, husband and wife, family, people who would come up to me and they would Latin and say, you really, you are from Cleveland. That's amazing. It was not considered racist. Now it's very tricky in my voiceover world to navigate that because it's like, you're not allowed to do it. And I'm like, I get it, but like, I'm, I'm honestly, it comes from a place of great love. Like that guy, I could do that guy all day, man. It's a fun guy to sit and talk it, to, it, man. Oh, I would sit and talk Honey to that do, guy. Honey man. Oh, I would have him <laughs> Oh, man. You know, the one thing I love is I sit on my front porch and I just have some honeydew, man. <laughs> you know this, Ryan Sickler. He had this motherfucker on talking some shit, man, some black shit. <laughs> <laughs> I have talked to that guy for hours back home. I really but That's, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, usually these two teeth, for some reason, they make it. <laughs> You know what I mean? You how see do these those, two teeth How do they stay? <laughs> All the other shit's gone, but usually the, these the two one, teeth. The one thing my mama told me, always take care of your front teeth. <laughs> Just those two? <laughs> Just those two. I can open shit with these. I mean. <coughs> oh, yeah, God man. damn, dude. Hand me a can of beans. Watch this shit. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Darnell. <laughs> Rolo. Roll over. So, I, so I'm rifling through my dad's shit to find a porn magazine. Oh, wait. Are we talking about your stepdad my, now? My stepdad. Okay, I'm looking through my stepdad stuff. shit. Right, yes. And I see an envelope. Top drawer of his dresser, I see an envelope that says my my real father's name on it. Now, is is his last name Thompson? No. It's not. No. I don't know if I should say the last name. No, don't. I'm not going to say yeah. it. Because these people, you know, I've they'll, had find, some, it. I've had they'll find it. I found your real father. <laughs> yeah, it'll take 10 minutes. Get yeah. a 20 page uh, email. <laughs> I want you to know I located your family and I took the liberty of adding them yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> and I made a Photoshop of you with your dad. <laughs> I'm just trying to be nice. I'm just here to help. <laughs> Those are the, those are the yeah, fans I my, had. My favorites. Yeah. They're just here to helpers. Let's take a quick break and tell you about our first sponsor, Ritual. We deserve to know what we're putting in our bodies and why, especially when it comes to something we take every day. Ritual's clean, vegan-friendly multivitamin is formulated with high-quality nutrients in bioavailable forms your body can actually use. What you won't find are sugars, GMOs, major allergens, synthetic fillers, and artificial colorants. Look, I take this every day. I, I'm always looking for a multivitamin to take. Forever I've been looking for it. I've been reading about these one a days you take, they have sawdust and all this other stuff in it, all right? These 
are legit, okay? A multivitamin should contain key nutrients and forms your body can actually use to help fill gaps in the diet. No shady extras. I've been taking these now for, I think this is three months now, and I love it. Uh, Ritual's delayed release capsule design delivers high quality nutrients, including vitamin D3 and just two daily pills. Ritual is made traceable. You'll always know what nutrients you're taking and where they come from. Thanks to Ritual's one of a kind visible supply chain. Ritual is designed with your life stage in mind. Get key nutrients without the BS. Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash honeydew to start your ritual today. Our next sponsor is Stitch Fix. Uh, now, you guys know online shopping can be overwhelming. You never know if things will fit. Returns are difficult. And you don't even know what store to start with. I get stuff and I get home. It's got this little weird tag on the back or, or the back's way longer than the front. I, I'm always super picky about that stuff. So this season... Let Stitch Fix do all the hard work. Stitch Fix offers clothing hand-selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and budget. Every piece is chosen for your fit and your life, and it's the easy solution to finding what makes you look and feel your best. Try on pieces at home before you buy, keep your favorites, and send back the rest. Stitch Fix has free shipping, easy returns and exchanges, and a prepaid return envelope is included. There's no subscription required, all right? So you can try Stitch Fix once or set up automatic deliveries. You'll pay just a $20 styling fee for each box, which gets credited toward pieces you keep. And there are no hidden fees ever. All right, Stitch Fix has styles and clothing to fit any occasion for women, men, and kids. They ship all over the U.S., and they're available in the U.K. as well. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash honeydew, and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash honeydew for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash honeydew. Now, let's get back to the do. So I found this envelope with my real father's name on it. Um, and I open up the envelope and inside is a tiny piece, a little square piece of paper that's been cut out of a newspaper. And it's an obituary notice. Oh, shit. That's how I found out my dad died. So they had any, how long, how long? It must have been. Recent? Recently. I used, I thought, I got really mad. And I didn't know how to bring it up to my mom. Was and you're like, what did you say, about 15? 15, yeah. So did you bring it up right away? Well, I had to figure out a way to bring it up without being like, so I was looking for uh, something <laughs> yeah, to jerk yeah. off to. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to jerk off. Just trying to come and you, you know find I mean? out your dad's so, dead. So I'm, so I'm mopping up at Kmart one night, and these three <laughs> girls come in, and they say they're lost. And I say, okay, I can help you out. Next thing I know, they're sucking my dick. <laughs> Page two, you know. But I'm try I'm like I'm just trying to find you know a dirty magazine. So I I just basically I said I was looking for a so I thought one of my socks had gotten in there or something you know because you you were forbidden to go in that room. Don't go in there, Josh. He had it amazing. The penthouse was like it was an amazing time. Man. Yeah, and that was the dirty one too. Playboy oh, was yeah. nice, but girls peeing in cups and shit like that. <laughs> oh, that, that was penthouse. <laughs> no, you're thinking of it was close. No, you're thinking of like uh, you're talking about like the, Wee and Swank. Penthouse was peeing all over the place. Were they peeing all over? Yeah. I didn't. We didn't have those. They got into pee for a while. Oh, maybe he that was probably, later. probably wasn't his. Yeah, thing. It wasn't you his thing. Mean? Yeah. <laughs> One time, my buddy Joe and I, oh, my mom, uh, I was such a stupid fucking kid. I, I uh, would get dirty magazines from the older guy. His name was Greg, and he worked at Subway Sandwiches and Salads with me when I was 15. Yeah. That was my first was job. Was that what it was back in the day? It was Sandwiches and Salads? Sandwiches that and what it was called? Trying to, church, to trying to church it up. <laughs> yeah. Subway Sandwiches and Salads. <laughs> and they'd have Subway maps on the wall like, this is a New York thing. Meanwhile, it's like the shittiest meat, you know. But I worked there. Andy and Robbie Saradakis were this Greek couple. It was a franchise. They ran it. Come here, Josh. You're a good boy. And uh, Andy would always say, uh, all right, mind the store, Josh. I got a, I got a meeting. Meanwhile, the meeting was down the street at the Broadview Tavern. You know, oh, he's you, down there you drinking. come back smelling like a bottle of, you know, hi, you're a good boy. You're a good boy. That's when he'd be real nice to you after he was drinking. But uh, Greg, the older guy, would always score me dirty magazines. So I had a nice collection going in my bottom drawer. And one night after school, got back from high school, real tired, I decided to read a little swank. And I fell asleep on it. I had the magazine open. Oh, shit. And I just fell asleep on it. And I wake up and I feel like a slight tugging under my head. 
and I don't I don't really know what's going on. I wake up, I look up, and there's my mom. And she doesn't know yet what yeah. she's pulling out. It could be a comic book. could be Cracked Magazine. <laughs> you press go, your fucking face. You try to like press your face. Huh? Huh? <laughs> and then she, and as soon as she, oh, oh, Josh, oh. You know, it's a sin against the church. Oh, sure, my yeah. God. So then she makes my dad throw out all his magazines. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An audible sigh. Oh. <laughs> so, but she threw him in the garbage can. And a couple days before that, my dad had thrown a dead raccoon in this garbage can. Oh, man. So now the magazines are on top of a maggot infested raccoon carcass. That did not stop no, me and my friend no Joe. For, yeah, hormone. That ain't no match We for dressed all in black. I don't know why, because it was my own front yard. We dressed all in black. It was the summer of, uh, you know, 88, 87. We led a reconnaissance mission out to the garbage can and took those magazines and kept them. We, we divided them among ourselves and we kept them. It was a beautiful That's thing. That's a good score. Yeah, yeah man. It was yeah. pretty exciting. Swank, club, hustler, you know. So uh, I found out that my real father was gone. And... Uh, it it just it really broke me in half because I would it was like oh I'll never get a chance to did you think at the time you ever would I did it, so you were building you were sure. hoping you would yeah I thought okay. maybe you know I bet someday I'll meet him someday I'll reach out and meet him and it just I mean, that was it it was like but you never tried to call that number in the card after that or anything like that to get a hold of anyone I, I did you did fuck yeah. But listen, I just want to say something real quick. I hope you know what he passed from because genetics are everything when it comes to health <laughs> and we're getting older. You should look into that shit, dude. I'm just saying that. I want to say you know that. Throw it out to you. You should. My mom says this to me. This is last year after all this time. I'm almost 46. And my mom says, I said, yeah, mom, I, uh, I'm going to go. Oh, no, it's when I had an operation. I had a double, uh, I had her a hernia. I had a double, what is it, an in inguinal hernia? So they had to do both sides. And just before the surgery, they were like, do you have any history of anything? I said, Mom, is it, there's nothing in our family. She go, oh, actually, no, your, your real father had a you know, heart heart condition. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, what back. are we, what? <laughs> so you might not make it. <laughs> that's the kind of shit you got to know, Thanks, man. Thanks, Ma. <laughs> Listen, if your family. parents fucking hate you and you ain't talked to them or you don't know them for any reason, <laughs> just try to get their health <laughs> records. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you really need. Family secrets, man. Yeah. Don't keep that a secret. That's right. the one thing. So high school, I'm about to graduate from high school. And I went to Catholic school. Um, and uh, you got to understand that this was 19, early 1990s in Cleveland, in the Midwest. And that's important for what I'm about to tell you. Because what I'm going to tell you right now is no big deal now. I tell this to people, they go, okay, yeah, who cares? But at the time, my mom picked me up from school one day, unannounced. I, I was like, what? what's that going on? That wasn't normal. Not normal at you. all. Yeah. She said, uh, hey, I just wanna, I wanna talk to you about something. I said, okay. So she had McDonald's. That was the way to my heart. Well, apparently not. Actually, now that I know about the heart condition, it was kind of a real <laughs> fucked up thing for my mom to do. To hey, kill I have a Big Mac, <laughs> you fucking asshole. Fuck, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, wash that down with a oh, half a jug of sugar, a little prick. Oh. So we go to a park. She takes me to one of the parks. And we're sitting. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, well, I, I got to tell you something about your father. He's not dead? You know, is he, were you lying about that? I don't know what it's going to be. And she says, um, well, you know, he died. He died. He had a, a they said, brain tumor. She said he died of a brain tumor. Do you know how old? He was 30. Whoa. 36. Maybe? Oh, holy shit. Very yeah, That's weird, too. I've outlived my father. Me, same. I, yeah. I had a weird time with it. It's weird. I'm. Ha it's weirder right now for me as I'm, you know, about- To be older than yeah. your dad. I'll right. never feel older than him. I say it all the time. I know it's weird, but I'll yeah. never feel like I'm not his son and I'm younger. Right. You know, I don't know. That's. I, I get it. Yeah, I feel that way. And And- she said, you know, he was, uh, he moved to San Francisco to the, he moved to the Bay Area when you were very young uh, because he was gay. Okay. Now, 
when you're going to a Catholic school in the Midwest and that bomb is dropped on you, it was a huge fucking deal. It's not a big deal at all now, at all, at, in any way. No. But at the time, it was like, am, am, I, am I gay? I don't know how this works. Right. We didn't know how it worked. So all I know is that there was a service for him here in, in Cleveland. There was a service for him, but I think he was he was either buried or his ashes were scattered in San Francisco. And it wasn't until, oh, and then, and then several years after that, my mom gives me an envelope that, is written on the front of the envelope. It says, to be given, no, poems about Josh by his father to be given to Josh when he's 21. Now, I don't know what kind of fucking arbitrary age that was. I don't know whose wish that was. But I got this envelope of poems that my dad had been writing over the years as I was growing up. No. Bro, but I'm also assuming he, like, no one expects to be dead at 36. Right. So at some point, you're he's alive when you get these, and then maybe that's the beginning of this next chapter that's what for he's, you guys. What, what, what kills me, and, and you're a father, so this yeah. is really, imagine if, <laughs> I mean, I'm not even a parent, and it makes me really sad to think about this. Like, you can no longer see your child, and you're writing letters to them that are not getting to them. You're hoping they do, but there's this intermediary channel. My dad would send it to his mom, and then his mom would send it to my grandmother, my mom's mom, and then somewhere along the way, it, it, it wouldn't get to me. So they were holding on to this, maybe by his wishes, to, to maybe be given to me when I was 21. That's 21. probably what I think. Okay. But I'm gonna read you one of you these. You brought them. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait. Josh Robert Thompson came prepared. <laughs> I just want you to know, the last time Jeremiah Watkins read from <laughs> Journal, we had a fucking tear fest. We get the get the uh, tissues. Here we go. Get them, Ash. But I'll do it as Morgan Freeman. Right, Maybe okay. that'll help. Is this? Let me ask a quick question. Is this the first one you ever read? Right here. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first one yeah. in that stack. Yeah. So this is really no matter what voice you use right, right now. In your own thoughts, you read this man's words. This, this is the first communication you've that, ever had that's with your exactly father. exactly it. But the communication's coming from your head reading yeah. this. Fuck. This, this is another. This is him that's speaking deep. to me. Yeah, this is the first time beyond. you've ever communicated. Yeah, and it's from beyond. It wasn't meant to be, I'm guessing, right. at 36. Yeah. But this is the first time you've ever yeah, communicated. It's not like, He's dead. It's not like, by the time you read this, I will be long gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have inherited Soul nothing. <laughs> Good luck. You have inherited a bad heart. <laughs> You'll most likely get your ass kicked a lot as a kid. So here's here's the first one. This is from 1985. This is from your father as narrated by Morgan. That's right. Joshua, I'm a little lonelier today. It's your birthday. <laughs> oh, this is so sad. It's sadder in Morgan Freeman's voice. Ten years old. Wow. I'm missing you. Yes, today a bit more. Dude. I mean, I can't even, this guy's sitting here writing this, got no way to see me. And, 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 you know. And who knows about <clears throat> the gay thing and not, was he in the closet? Was he being tortured well, by his own sexuality as well as being, not being able to That's correct. Be, man, I this mean, is what I have so much going on. This. And he's a young man. This really opened my eyes to what it must be like to grow up, you know, in the LGBTQ community, feel like you're different. And especially, you got to imagine, man, growing up in Cleveland when he was in the 70s, when he, he was a kid, <clears throat> I mean, it had to have been rough to keep that a secret. I mean, he, you know, he got married. He got, I mean, he got, you know, he was, my did mom. Did what you were supposed to do <clears throat> back then, yeah. And they were kids. I mean, they were 20 and they were both art students. That that's how my mom met my my real father. They were art students together. They went to art school together. He was an artist. He was a painter. And in fact, he went to San Francisco and had a bunch of big art shows, you know, 
he did it. He did his thing. But I can't imagine. Um, I don't know what his relationship was like with his father. I mean, I never met his father. His father died a long, long time ago. But I know it wasn't the best. And like a big Italian family. I, I don't know what it was like for him. I'm, I'm still piecing the piece, putting yeah. all the pieces together. But here's a. Uh, I want to ask real quick. Yeah. Um, oh, I just lost my th- my question, but it's. Uh, I'll come back to it. Go ahead. I don't want to stop your your poetry. Sickler had smoked too much that day. <laughs> so he was it high never as happened. a kite. <laughs> it finally <laughs> caught up with him. Not only could he not remember the question he was going to ask, he didn't know how to get home after the show. <laughs> Uh, no, here's one. Um, this is from, there's no date on this. There's no date. It says, happy, birth, happy birthday in just six days. It's entitled Void. Uh, I missed you before. I miss you now. Yet I like tuna fish sandwiches, especially if I could share them with you. I don't know why. What, is that real? Are you fucking That's real, with me? dude. <laughs> I can't tell when you're fucking over here. That almost sounded like a titty sprinkles Didn't it moment. Don't? Yeah. Me. I was like, tuna fish? I don't know, fuck. Maybe peanut butter and jelly. Is this my dad? Man. No, so that, you, that one killed me, though. Just this image of this guy just sharing yeah. a sandwich with his son. Sitting next to you and splitting it. I see it from the back, too. I see the sandwich hand. That's. Um, man. And you're so. I, I want to. I, I got my question. Yeah. Are right. you in a box? Like, are these presented to you, and you're just reading one after the other? Yeah. In this moment. Yeah. Holy shit. And I don't know what to. And how know. long after he died? You said about six years. Well, because you're 21. Here's the last one. This is. This is maybe. Do you know when it's dated? This, it is. Yeah, I do, and it's five months before he died. Five. Months. I also want to ask you, and this is another question, uh, if you have a picture of him and do you look like him, we'll come back to I do. Yeah, I will. Um, this is, this this is last no, November one. 89. Oh, so so I'm my 14. father died. Yeah? November 27th, 1989. Okay, I'm so 16. This, wow. So I was, four, I was 14 this is, years this old. Is, this is what's fucked up, too, is this is holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, coming right, right around the corner. And yeah. he's sitting there yeah. on Thanksgiving by himself. I don't know who he's right. got with him. To hold you just once. Oof. What color is your hair now? Mom is trying to get a picture of you. She talked to your grandmother yesterday. It's my mom's mom. No matter. I see you as a young gentleman. Hope you are talented. That one fucking gets me, man. Oh. If only he, you know, I wish he could see what I had, you know, what I did. Yeah. You know, uh, your grandma says you are very good in writing. Good, good. I hope I read some of it. I love you, Joshua. I hope I get to see you. November 89. Damn. That was it. And you, what did you say he passed of? You're not sure? Well, so they told me it was uh, a brain tumor. Here's where the story gets very emotional because I finally made that phone call. I got a phone number from my mom that said, this is an Italian family, and it said, Uncle Joey. <laughs> call you, he call you? You look just fucking like- Uncle Joey. <laughs> you call me? Who the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. That's what I would be thinking. You, <laughs> That's exactly how my family would Excuse me? The phone. You playing a fucking joke? <laughs> Don't fuck with me. You're talking about my brother, you fucking <laughs> cocksucker. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, no. I'm his son. I, I I had to make this phone call. I call this guy Uncle Joey. Okay, so you don't call that number from the card years ago. <clears throat> no. Okay, this is a new number, new person. Yeah. All right, Uncle Joey, and he's like, "Holy shit, who?" I go, "It's Josh, Joshua." I'm, I'm like, "That's I'm, you know, I'm I'm your brother's son." Oh my god! He's like, "I can't," you know. Did he know? Yeah. About you? Okay, he's they like, did. Wow. How, how, you know, I said, love this. I'm going to be in town. Where are they in Cleveland? They're all in Cleveland. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to be in town and, uh, I'd like to meet you guys. Oh, shit. You know, so I mean, now, now I'm hearing from, well, he's the liaison. So Uncle Joey was, uh, all right, I set up for you. No problem. <laughs> Tell you what, meet us over at the deli. 
Uh, you know, on Third Street. <laughs> Over on Euclid. We'll talk about that thing. We'll Around the back. That thing. Don't bring anybody. <laughs> Come by yourself. Park three blocks down and walk over there. <laughs> Don't wear a jacket or nothing. You're going to get patted down at the... No, none of this. But I met him at a nursing home because my grandmother, the woman that had been trying to get a hold of me all these years, the woman who apparently her heart was just broken in two, that one of her grandchildren... I can't... She yeah. could never see him again, right? So she did get to see you at some point? Well, I went to the nursing home to meet everybody. They wanted me to meet them there. And it was like Our Lady of, you know, the lifted chair or whatever the hell it was called. <laughs> I don't know. The lifted chair. No, I mean, it, these are real, you know, oh my God. Look at a chair, it's lifting. It's a fucking miracle. <laughs> Do you remember the miracle of lifted chair in a Bible? So I, I, and it's a beautiful, pla beautiful place, man. I mean, it's right out of, you know, everything you think about the Catholic Church. I mean, these are real, Devout Catholic attendance. And who are family. you meeting? Who's in attendance when you Everybody. get there? Everybody. Uh, you know, my two aunts, his sister, my aunts. I'm from Cleveland. Me two aunts. I, you know, I remember the black people in Cleveland, they would say auntie. They're they're proper about it. Auntie, my auntie. They'd be like, hey man, well, first of all, man, this motherfucker owe me money and I'm tired of this motherfucker coming to me talking this shit, man. You know, but tomorrow, man, I got to go down the street because I'm about to visit my auntie. <laughs> So my my two aunts are there, uh, Joey. I mean, their kids, their spouses, then all these grandkids. I walk in, dude. I walk into this room. I walk into this facility, into a big room, like a ballroom area almost. All these people are looking at me, and then they say, one of them, my aunt says, "Hold on a minute, I'll be right back. Got someone I want you to meet." And they, she pushes this wheelchair out, and there's this little sweet old lady who can't talk because she's had a stroke. Oh. So she can't even speak to me. And she looks up at me and she starts to just cry. And she, I don't know how she communicated with my aunt, but in, she had indicated somehow that I looked just like her son, her my father. And it was like seeing oh. him again because I had grown a beard out a little bit. And she was like, I mean, bittersweet, oh too. He's gone. And now here you are. And I don't know who I am to any of these right. people. I don't know who they are to me. And it was, and I, 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 all I could do was just embrace this woman. And uh, it was like my only link to this man. And, um, and then a year later. Now, his, was his brother there at that? Yeah, he was. Okay. Yeah. And what was that like? I mean, it, I, I, I don't, I only really just remember that part with my grandma, but I, there was a lot of, it was all a blur. People were just shaking my hand and, hey, Don, I'm Uncle Pino. <laughs> I'm Cousin Vinny. And you're like, I, I don't, I guess I'm an asshole from Hollywood. I feel like such a douche. You know, I got like a suit coat on. <coughs> People are wearing Browns jerseys. Oh, look at a guy all dressed up, this fucking <laughs> yeah. guy. And I'm like, oh, they're already starting in on me. That's great. And, uh, but I think it must have been maybe a year or two later that, uh, that that my grandmother was dying and uh i went back to cleveland and i visited her in the hospital and i sat with this woman that i don't know and i held her hand in that hospital that's nice you know I mean, she didn't you know she passed away not long after that but i just felt like it was something i had to do and not Last just last year, that family sent me a box of my Your dad's family. stuff. Yeah, well, my fa my family, that mm -hmm. family, those people, those <laughs> fucking people over there. Your family, you know, my family. We don't really. I mean, we we stay in touch here and there. Yeah, well, there's all different weird. kinds of relationships and families. You know there I mean? just are some pay dividends years and years down the road. And so, what did they send you? Well, they sent me a box of just a lot of his things. I guess they were cleaning out grandma's house or I don't, someone else had been living there for a while and they were finally gonna i don't know what the deal was but pictures someone else was in here like get this hey, shit out of hey, here hey man what is this shit doing in here man <laughs> trying to visit my auntie it means nothing to them and everything to <laughs> it's you some bullshit <laughs> yeah. man all the scribbles and shit who cares about this man tired yeah, of through half of them out hey rollo <laughs> burn all this shit rollo <laughs> burn it rollo you motherfucker <laughs> So uh, no man, it was all it was a lot of his artwork, and uh, and there were uh, sketchbooks, and I started leafing through it. Some of his high school sketchbooks, his drawings looked exactly like the ones I do because I'm an artist. No way. I draw, you know, cartoons and stuff. And then the I style, came, like the same yeah, it's sort very of style. similar. Yeah, wow. 
which was interesting that to me. That is crazy. I'm like, this is crazy. And then I came, and then the one thing that really got me was a picture of him uh, in San Francisco. It was a picture of him standing with all these other guys. I imagine this was his group of guys he hung out with. And they were at a, I don't know, a bar, a restaurant, I don't know. But I looked at this guy in this photo, and he, he looked so happy. And I thought, he fucking did it. Like, he... He found his people. Even for a short while, he found his people and he found happiness. He made it out of Cleveland. And our journeys were similar in that sense where I, I you know, the, the key here is to get the fuck out of Cleveland, I think is what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Ravens did. <laughs> did LeBron leave again? Is he back? The key is you, to, the get key the is to leave. Out of yeah. No, but he he did it, man. He did it. it, it like, and and I realized, uh, you know, he had an art show, and it wasn't the biggest art show in the world. But none of that shit matters. I, I used to put so much importance on like, you got to be in the biggest movies. You, you you didn't fucking know. He made it. He did it. He did it. And I did learn that you know he died of AIDS, it was AIDS yeah. which I assumed. I don't know why how'd that. You, how'd you learn? They told me. Uh, my aunt told me she did. at that reunion. Your auntie. She was like my auntie. She was like, and of course you know he died of AIDS. Of and I'm like, oh, like that. of course I do. <laughs> Just spitting it out. Like he's that. got heart problems. Anything else I should know about? <laughs> His AIDS hereditary. <laughs> yeah, can I get AIDS? Do any of you have it? <laughs> Fucking. So is there anything from this keepsake box that you um, have prominently displayed in your home? Or you know you... what? That's amazing you asked me that. My therapist. <laughs> this is what I do, bro. But honestly, dude, my therapist just asked me that two days ago. How long you been seeing this therapist? About two years. You need a new therapist. Like. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't even an hour, bro. <laughs> the honeydew. If you're looking to get therapy for free, come to the honeydew. <laughs> Dr. Sickler's gonna put you in shape. Oh, shit. Sickle cell? They call you sickle cell? Uh, listen, a, a, That's a fucked few up, people man. do, yeah. That's fucked Tom up. Tom Segura, Christina, that whole crew, they all, it's cell? the worst name. I just saw thing. somebody tweeted that today, and yeah. I was like, he ain't figuring that. He's a delivery He's not gonna... driver. Yeah. Fucking goes, you all right, man? <laughs> Sickle cell centers closed. You These can't, professionals are out there. You silent. can't make those. You can't be saying that shit in Cleveland, yeah. man. Sickle cell, man. No, My whole family got this shit. Uh, the one pic- I think the picture of him with, uh, His friends. with all those friends. Because you have it up? I'm going to put, that's the yeah. one I'm going to frame. I mean, and who has pictures? I mean, it's weird. Like we all have pictures on our phones. I, I mean, I remember as a kid, we everyone had framed pictures everywhere. I don't, I don't have any because I don't have anybody in my life. I have nothing. So put that next to the picture of my cats. You should put that picture. Up. <laughs> no, I should, man, because because uh, that's a reminder of like after the the late late show when the late late show ended. I really had this idea of what was supposed to happen after that show. I had these expectations like of how what? it sh- like. This is a springboard. Everyone's going to know me now. The industry's going to go, there's the guy that was Jeff the Robot. <laughs> not, not one fucking person knew. No one knew. gives a fuck about that. <laughs> Nobody. I was the robot. I mean, I spent so much. I'm the robot. Don't know what that means. Good luck. Get in line. Family you know? guy for how many years? 10 years. 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. But when you're a voice actor, you're always... I guess that's part of the gig. You're just trying to convince people that. But most voice actors act with their voice, right? And they have a, a window and a range, right. of higher or lower. You are just, I mean, you're a Swiss Army knife. You're so fucking dynamic. It's like, yeah. But you're right. You can't do certain things anymore. But it's. But it, where are they going to find Rollo? I mean, are they really going to go cast? <laughs> hey man, are they really going to go find? No, th- him? this happened on. Um, one of the show, one of the shows I do, this happened. They called me and said, "Hey, man, because I do Morgan Freeman a lot," and they said, "We got a note that we're going to have to recast the Morgan Freeman." And I was like, "What are you fucking talking about? Morgan Freeman knows I do it." Like, yeah, we know, we love you, but you know, you're white. I'm like, dude, I'm not doing a, I'm doing uh, yeah. a voice of another person. A per, a he, yeah, He's not a, a race, not a generic. What I think black it's people, Asian people, white people sound like. That's it. It's. I'm imitating. That's someone. exactly right. And so, I, okay. And then, and they had they held auditions for two weeks. They came back. I was and say. They said, 
<laughs> All right. So anyway, never mind uh, that. It's going to be another 10000 yeah. a week. Yeah. But I, you know, it made me, it, that this story of my father makes me appreciate my life and what I have. And it's it's okay to aspire to want more, of course. Of course. Unless you're from Cleveland, then keep it on the down low. <laughs> Don't tell anybody about it. But I, I look at his life and I think, geez, you know, he, he had these amazing, I have all these photos of his art gallery shows and he's all dressed up and he's happy as can be. And, you know, he found his place in the world. Like I said, if but for a short while, none of it doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't, you don't have to be the biggest star in the universe. Just be happy. That's and and the takeaway is just make what you want to make. Do what you want to do. Don't worry about the likes and the favorites and the, you know, and, and, and I got into, after the Late Late Show, I got into like social media stuff and fighting with trolls for years. Years. Just like, I, you know, I, I've had five drinks. I could go to sleep or I could go live for five hours and yell at people. <laughs> I think I'll do that. Five hours. I think I'll do that. <laughs> but I realized that the trolls and all the I would do this live I do live streaming a lot way back in the day before Facebook was doing it. This was like early days. None of us knew what the fuck we were doing. And uh, I realized that all the people that I would get into it with, the people that would say horrible things like, you suck, you're a has-been, you're washed up, you're a loser, you're a nobody. It's like, the reason I was upset is because, yeah, I, th I think that about me. You can't fucking say that about me. Right. You know, it's that thing of Only like, I, get to say I hate my dad. Yeah, your yeah. dad's an asshole. Fuck you, yeah. man. Don't say that about yeah. him. So I realized I was, it was like I was going back to the playground again mentally back in time to that school, urban community school, and like feeling like, I guess that's what I deserve. I guess it's over. Like, I thought The Late Late Show was a fluke thing. Like, I was on that show for eight years. God, you've had good runs just on luck. a couple of things. If you never do anything again. <laughs> <laughs> if you never do anything in your life. <laughs> Ever again. <laughs> You're 40. You've you know. Lived, you outlived your dad. Well, what the oh, fuck else oh do you my want? God. <laughs> You know, your dad died at a very young age. Granted, it was from AIDS, but... <laughs> Granted, it was. If you do nothing else ever in the history of your life, <clears throat> you should be grateful. And I am grateful. <clears throat> I'm, I, I, I love it. It was an amazing show to be a part of. I loved working with Craig, and we went on tour for years. Yeah. But the way that show ended was so horrible. Like, it was the most painful thing I'd ever gone through in a job. Why? Is How be did it go? I, I mean, it was like... Did you have a heads up? Craig called me like six or seven months before the show okay. ended. And he's like, so listen, man, so here's what we're going to do. So I'm on the set of a show and I'm making a shitload of money. But anyway, you're going to be fine, man. You know, uh, I just want to let you know that I'm stepping down and, you know, but you'll be taken care of, man. We'll, we'll tour and everything. So I was, like, I was really nice of him to do that. Like he was, he was on the set of Hot in Cleveland, the show that they did a while back, Betty White and everyone yep. was on. So he was a guest star on there. And he called me while they were doing his makeup just to let me know this is what's up. And I was like, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, when the show ended, uh, the second to last show, he had me come out during the beginning of the show and inter introduce me as this is the guy that did the voice of Jeff the Robot. You know, I, I it, Jeff the Robot, for most people who don't know, was a talking skeleton, yeah. like an Ed McMahon, yeah. that sat at this lectern, and I puppeteered Jeff. You know, I actually moved his body and his arms and his mouth and everything, and then I had all these musical instruments backstage, and I would make all these noises, and then I would also make the phone on Craig's desk ring. There was a button on the floor I pushed with my foot, and I was all the callers on the phone, so I was doing all these voices. There was a lot of shit going on back there. Um, you know, and he finally, he brought me out and was like, what do you do for a living? You, the video's on YouTube. But uh, I said, um, you know, I do the voice of Jeff Peterson. And it's like fucking standing ovation. And I got a little nervous because nice. I don't want it to go on too long. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, mm, like, you know, like, because it's that thing. Like I would open for Craig, you know, I would tour with him and, He'd ask right before he'd go on. He'd be like, "How are they, man? How are they?" And you go, "They were good. They're good." You don't want to be like, "They were fucking great, man. They were eating out of the palm of my hands. They loved me." 
They fucking thought I was the best. You just want to, you know, so I, I had that nervousness about it. Um, but it moved me, man. It really was like people finally got to see me. Yeah. And that's why I thought this is going to lead to some big stuff. Uh, at the end of that taping, Craig got in his car, and I think went to the airport, went back to Scotland. Uh, I went next door with all all the crew, and we had a goodbye party at the uh, what is it the, the Wood Ranch restaurant? Yeah. You know, right next to CBS Television mm-hmm. City. And by the way, this was an amazing job for me because Television City has such history, man. Oh yeah, the Carol Burnett show and All yeah. in the Family. And you still got the Price is Right in there, and Price other is Right as right well. below yeah. us. Mm-hmm. So I'm all about old TV history, and it was it was such an honor to be on that show. I mean, we got away with everything, dude. We just showed up and made shit up. Everything we did on that show, for the most part, was just improvised. We never planned That's anything, great. Yeah. you know. And but he left town. I got really shit faced at this farewell party, and we all said our emotional goodbyes. And then early the next morning, I got a call from CBS. Yeah, I'm hungover. And he said, you need, we need you to come get your shit, basically. I was like, what are you talking about? Well, uh, you have stuff in your office still. I said, yeah, I was just coming on Monday. This was like was like the weekend. Yeah, we need you to come get your stuff like in the next hour, okay? Because uh, the James Corden show, that's the next guy that took over for The Late Late Show. Uh, his people are here. They're renovating the office, and they, they need to knock the wall down. <laughs> There's a guy standing by with a sledgehammer. You need to come get your shit. Oh, okay. So I'm hungover. I'm already sad and emotional about yeah. the end of this show. This And you don't, like, this robot, no one knew that this was going to happen. Craig, no one knew that this dynamic between he and I, between the robot and Craig, was going to become the biggest part of the show at the end of its run. I mean, it, you could not separate the two. Craig had a lot of like uh, sound machines and little gadgets that he'd have throughout the years, but he got bored with all of them. So when the robot came along, we I just assumed he would do it for a couple weeks and then he'd get rid of it. And then somehow it just, we struck gold. So like it was... it was this really special thing that we never knew would become yeah. what it was. So... To have it go out that way, so I show up, I walk by the soundstage where our studio was, and it was completely empty. This crew, amazing crew, they had already dismantled the entire thing. There wasn't There's one, no stage. there was nothing in Damn. it. Damn. I was like, oh, it's like that. Went up to my office, and there were there was a crew standing by. You guys, Is this your office? Yeah. All right, we need you to get this stuff out of here. We got a... Uh, Got one of these metal roller, uh, little flatbed things. Just go ahead and roll your shit. So you remember the end of Indiana Jones and the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? The very end of that movie, the uh, Ark of the Covenant is boxed up in a crate. Yeah. And there's this weak old guy (laughs) just wheeling it through this warehouse. (laughs) And the camera's pulling back like this, and there's this box. That was me. Josh hunched over the cart, (laughs) pushed his wares down a long long hallway. Perfect. Into an elevator and up another flight of stairs. Three long trips. Three long trips filled with memories. Three of them. Huh? Three, dude. <laughs> you know why? Because the wall, the wall in my office was covered with all the fan art and letters and props and amazing things that people sent to me over the years. And I had to box this all up. But like quick, like imagine the guys just <laughs> like, standing there going, come on, up. man, we got to go. <laughs> So I, I put it all in my car, and uh, the last thing I heard as I was wheeling out of there was them starting to knock that wall down. And that was like an ominous, like, this is a taste of, like, what's to come for you, you know. And um, honestly, now, you know, it was a weird history for me with that because we did Comic-Con a couple times with The Late Late Show, and they said, Jeff the Robot's going to be at Comic-Con. And I was like, this is fucking great. I mean, I, I loved being on that show. That was the greatest gig. It was like the dream gig for me because ever since I was a kid, I would build like talk show sets in my basement out of cardboard and my friends were always my guests. Johnny Car- I was a big fan of Johnny Carson. Yeah. Which, by the way, I remember my, my grandfather, uh, Craig and I had toured and made our way through Cleveland. That's always fun performing in front of your entire family. Yeah. 
They had shown up at the Cleveland Rock Casino, the Hard Rock Rock Casino. <laughs> and I don't know who was there. I just know that a lot of my family members showed up and um, did the stand up. The, the sad thing is, I think I heard from two people after that. I don't. I didn't hear from anybody else. So I was like, I don't know if anybody showed up. Two years later, at my, I'm at my grandfather's 90th birthday party. He's 90 years old in his own house at his birthday. My grandfather pulls me aside, a man in his 40s, and says, you know, I was at that uh, stand-up show you did a few. Oh, you were? Because I had no idea because you never mentioned it. You remember <laughs> Dream of My Life, grandson growing up, entertainer? He goes, yeah. Um, a piece of advice from an old man. Uh, maybe don't use such vulgar language. Maybe don't work blue. And he's like, you know, guys like Red Skelton and Johnny Carson. I go, Johnny Carson beat the shit out of his wife? <laughs> He didn't work right. blue, though. Right. Yeah. right. Anyway, so- Cosby worked clean, too. You right. Know? Yeah. So I decided to <laughs> have yourself go ahead and drink the bar. But, uh, you know, I so I, I loved old TV, and I was so honored to be a part of that show, and we made something really special. It was just that I wished more people knew that I was the guy. So when we went to Comic-Con, it was a huge thing, man. I'm going to meet fans. I'm going to sign autographs. Here we go. So people lined up. Uh, there were thousands of people lined up to talk to Jeff Peterson. So Jeff the Robot was there. I was in the booth, you know, with the monitors. I could see people. Hi, how are you? I'm Jeff Peterson. Oh, man, people light up, you know. And I said, so can I go out and uh, meet meet everybody? And they said, oh, no, we, we got a directive from the network um, that you got to stay inside the booth. And I was like, but that doesn't make sense. Comic-Con is about, you know, people come to meet, you know, like Robert Downey Jr. doesn't walk around dressed as Iron Man. Right, yeah. You come to see him. Two years in a row, they made me stay in there and I couldn't come out and I couldn't meet anybody. And so- So how do you help yourself? Yeah. That, and so that's why, and I'm just saying this to people out there, you know, when I was going through a hard time after the Late Late Show, you know, I did get into it with people in live streams. And I feel bad about the people that got caught in the crossfire. I do. There were really good people that love this character. I love the character. I love the show. It's just that weird thing of like, I want you to know I was the character, but also I want you to like the other things I do, yeah. you know? So I got real angry for a while and I got real bitter and it was a bad look for me. Um, but therapy's, you know, definitely helped me out. I'm probably really? going to have a heart attack soon. <laughs> yeah, genetically, you're about, you're about due, bro. But, you know, <laughs> but that, you know, there's so many more stories about the Late Late Show, but, you know, the guy that, the guy that built Jeff the Robot, uh, Grant Imahara, he was the guy from Mythbusters, you know, he- Oh, really? He, he actually built that? Yeah, he, di oh. he died. He uh, died- I didn't know he that. He died last year. I didn't know that. Sad, man. From the virus? I, I, had, I know he had an aneurysm. Oh, man. Really tragic, you know. He's the guy that built that robot and showed me how to puppeteer it. So he's as much a part of that as, as anything. Uh, I just wanted to mention that because he, he was an amazing guy. And, um, you know, but you think about my dad's life, and then I think about other friends of mine. I got a friend right now. My friend, my buddy Matt, Matt Lodi, he's uh, he's been a sports reporter in Cleveland for for a year, over twenty years. He's an amazing guy, my best buddy, my best buddy in the world. And we grew up, uh, we met in junior high. We remain great friends ever since. And uh, he's been fighting stage four lymphoma for the mm. last couple of years. Damn. And you look at this guy and the way he conducts himself. It's mind blowing to me. That's what we talked about. Like, what am I? What am I complaining? Right, about? right. But he, we say that to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But a guy like that would never say that to you. That's right. He would know. What's your fucking problem? Right. This is a very religious guy. He's a hardworking guy. I mean, he has. I, I, I can't even imagine what it's like for him right now with all the therapy he's had, the, the chemo, and his wife is a saint. She's by his side every day. You know, he's one of these guys. You know, his family lives. The house he grew up in, his parents still live there, and it's like five blocks down the street. You know, I used to really kind of look at that like, well, you haven't even left. I left and went to another, I lived in LA, you know, you haven't done anything. And and as you get older, you go, you know, doesn't matter. It's not what it's about, man. No. He's, he's figured it out. I think That's he figured right. it out more than I did early on. They did. So I encourage people to uh, keep an eye out 
on my website because we're about to have a big fundraiser for him. All right. And been talking to uh, Craig Ferguson about it. We're going to sell Jeff Peterson T-shirts. Okay. And all the money's going to go to great. charity, all of it. Well, when you have the link and everything set up, send it to us and yeah. we'll try to include it into... I would love Will that. you have it up in the next few I weeks? I will. All right, then yep. we'll include it in your... Um, Ash, can we make sure we do that? Yeah, I would love that. You know, it's just... Anyway, life is... As you get older, people... You know, friends and family members start to die, but some of these people... You know, not at our age, you know, we're like like my friend Raymond that I did a bunch of public access TV with, uh, he died, he was 36. He's your dad age, your dad's age. Yeah. Yeah, it's young. My dad was 42 and 36 sounds crazy to me. I mean, he had uh, he had that, uh, John Ritter died from that uh, aortic dissection, you know, his heart just, and that one really, that was the one, that was in 2016, that was the one that like, pushed me over the edge. Yeah. That's when I kind of went to a dark place. And then Brody, obviously. Man. But, you know, and I'll tell you a positive about the social media. That's how I met Brody Stevens. He would watch my rants on live stream. Is that right? They were funny. I mean, they were funny. They weren't all dark. But he watched it and he was like, I saw your rants. Good stuff. <laughs> you got it. I got my Brody shit in the office right you over there. You got it. Yes. <laughs> 818 till I die. Arms crossed negative. She gets it. <laughs> she gets it. One of the funniest people in the world. That no guy, the, the, every, everything's been said about him already, but the comics comic. I mean, watching that guy do his thing was the funniest uh, examination of comedy. He just turned it on its head. And that's how we met. And that's how I did his show. He had me come on the Festival of Friendship. That's and great. we talked forever. And, you know, and he did his thing. That's, you just got to remember these people did their thing. You just got to, you got to do what makes you happy, you know, and don't. Are you happy now? I'm getting there. Yeah. I'm I'm right now uh, definitely happier than I've ever been. I don't say it too loud, you know, because COVID. Oh, I'm glad you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been out of work for six months, you piece of shit. <laughs> well, if you never yeah. do anything again. <laughs> hey, you know what? At least oh, you, you had that one job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, your mom died from COVID? Well, you know, if you never get another mom, you know what I mean? Yeah. At least you had one, right? <laughs> Fuck you. No, nah, man. So I'm 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 all right. I'm I'm in that phase where not phase, I'm in that part of my life where I love voiceover. I love doing voiceover. But now to me it's a day job and it's a great day job. It's the best fucking day job. It's a job. I'm not There's complaining no, about it. Let's get the adjectives. All these people that want to call date, you know, they all that use. I'm thank God I had a day job. Of I wrote and produced for years. Right. And if I don't have that skill or that ability, I don't do exactly. this. I don't do all these people want to demean by calling it a day job. It's no. a fucking job. Well, what I mean, I guess what but I mean. But you is, also work a lot of jobs. I do. Like all of us do. Right. I don't just work one exactly. thing. I, I'm doing 10 fucking things. And you're you know? always having to find always, the next thing, the next always. thing. And what's next? What's next? Right. But here's the crazy thing. Uh, it's just not number one on my list anymore. It That's takes right. all the pressure off. Number one on my list is, and going back to the letter that my dad wrote to me, number one on my list has always been writing. So now when I read that letter recently, I was like, holy shit, he's telling me yeah. you're, a, you're a good writer. So I started writing. I started writing a book and good. you know, it makes me very happy. And I would love to do that. I would love yeah. to, you know, filmmaking was my first love. I'd love to make a film and, and, uh, and something that I'd like to shoot in my old neighborhood, which is something I've been now, thinking about. Be, oh my God. You know, maybe roll up, put Rolo in there. I somewhere. mean, come on, dude. Be awesome. He's got to be in Morgan there. Freeman will narrate. All right. So <laughs> this was a great episode. I appreciate you coming on and opening up. I want you to to before I'm gonna ask you about advice you give your sixteen year old mm. self. And then I want you to take us out of the episode as Morgan Freeman. Okay. Okay. Out of your story and out of the episode. All right. And then I and then and go well, go ahead. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. So advice to my sixteen year old self. self. Yeah. You know, if I was sitting across from me at 16. Knowing everything you just told us, you finally yeah. found out. And all, jo not even joking when I say this, I would tell him, I would tell myself, man, you know, here's what you need to do. Trust me on this. Get out of Cleveland. <laughs> Get the. <f> <laughs> Get 
Listen, if you do nothing else. <laughs> nothing else. No, I would say um, do what makes you happy. What The only thing I could tell you is do not worry or give a fuck about what anybody says to you unless you are asking for their advice or they truly are your peers. You know, that's it. Do whatever you want, man. Do whatever you want. Great. And 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 really do it for yourself first. That's the key. Cuz a lot of people are chasing the likes and the views and I got to go viral and but they're probably not going to like no, just honestly make make work that is honest and true to you, man, and like do not worry about what anybody else says. Trust me. That's great. Trust me. And stay away from girls with tattoos above their asses. <laughs> Because, son, no. Let's so, um, plug everything you'd like to plug again here. Anything I you'd just like. just go to my website right now, the show dot com. The JRT T H C J R T Show dot com. Your one stop shop. Josh Robert Thompson, um, douchebag. Well, I uh, I am so glad you came on. This Thanks for having great. me, man. Of course. Um, take us out as Morgan Freeman, and I'll sign us off. Well, that's it for the Honeydew Podcast. I hope you learned some shit. I know I did. Dr. Sickler will be back with another patient next time. Until then, this is Morgan Freeman saying, get busy living or get busy dying. Because, hey, if you do nothing else in your life, at least you lived. <laughs> You're the man. Uh, as always, I say Ryan Sigler, RyanSigler.com. We'll talk to y'all next week.